like to show you first a couple of little things. Uh, this is my palette. Oh, oh, wait, let me let me go and make that a spotlight. Yes. Okay, this is my palette. It's called a possum, like the animal. The reason I use it is because it has cups like this that come out and they open up. I fill them full of paint from the tube and airtight seals. And I've had this palette at least for 10 years and the same paints are in them. And I just keep refreshing the paint and the paints never dry up. So I occasionally I'll have to add a couple of drops of water to keep them moist, but I find that very helpful. That's why I work with liquid paints. Uh, this is the reference I'm using. I've, I rearranged the composition a little bit. That's part of my, uh, what's the word, artistic license I have. And I use a lot of flat brushes and I use a lot of calligraphy brushes. So I use pointed brush and I use squares. I'm partial to the squares because my background is an oil painter. Mm -hmm. And I gave that up about 17 years ago, once I fell in love with watercolor. Uh, I'm going to start by ex explaining that I'm going to work with a middle value first. Usually the middle value is the color of the subject. Not always, but it's usually. And I use a lot of uh, dry brush. The paper that I use is 300 pound arches, rough. I, I like the rough paper. I like the heavy weight because I can do a lot with it. I usually beat up my watercolor paper a lot. By that I mean, I work on it a great deal. My big paintings, which are 30 by 40, usually take me anywhere from 60 to 80 hours to do. Now, dry brush, you have to smash your brush and then you lightly drag it across the paper. And you get these nice feathery quality there. I, I did do a uh, black and white sketch first, just to show you, so that I know my values. Normally, when I do these things, I do a very quick value sketch to understand the painting, and then I go into it. But uh, because of time constraint, I'm just sort of, I'm just, I put the brush down and then I pull it very quickly. And you get these, the feel of the leaves of the tree. I'm holding the brush sideways. One of the things that I'm very strong about is that every brush that you have in your possession 
has what I call a voice. Every brush has a different voice. What do I mean by that? Every brush makes a different mark. The quality of the mark. If you're going to learn how to paint, you have to learn like you learn your alphabet. You got to learn the alphabet first, and then you start making words. And then words, you make paragraphs. And paragraphs, you make stories. In watercolor, it's the same thing. You've got to learn your brush. Because that's what gives you the, the mark, the voice, the letter that people can read. So what do you, how do I learn this, you ask? Well, you get a brush, a brand new one, or just what you have if you want to learn about them, and you just get an old newspaper or an old newsprint pad, a bottle of ink or some extra paint, and you just dip the brush in it and make as many different marks as you can different ways over and over again. And after you finish with one brush, and I don't mean 10 minutes, I'm talking about three or four hours with each brush, then you go on to the next one. So that when you look at that brush again, you're gonna look at that brush from a different point of view. You know what it can do. Now I'm changing brushes to a calligraphy brush. And I think you understand what I'm saying is when I pick up a brush, I know exactly what brush I need for what I'm doing because I know the kind of a mark it's going to give me. Like here, I know this brush is going to give me this mark. You probably can't see it because it's kind of small. But each brush gives me a different mark. And each mark is like a, a letter. Or if you're a singer, a, a word, a sound. So that's what art is. You have to learn the sounds and the words those brushes make. Oh, it's terrific. You know, you can do a, <clears throat> a quick spontaneous, emotional painting. And we all have those experiences. I'll be the first one to admit it. But then you try to repeat it and you say, huh, what happened? If you know why it happened, what made it happen, you can repeat it over and over again. See how this is coming up? The leaves are starting to develop. I'm painting with the way the leaves are moving. That's another thing that artists sometimes are conscious of. I've always been extremely, extremely fascinated with musicians. Not necessarily with the music they play, but how they play it. They get their whole body. If you ever watch these musicians, they use their whole body to play the music. It's fabulous. They are 100% in their medium, in their element. And artists usually sit down on a chair, I hope, or a stool, And are not conscious that in order for them to feel what they're painting, they should become part of that painting. In other words, this leaf is, or fern is coming over on me. 
So I've got to get the feeling that it's moving and I try to feel that. Feel what you're painting. You find that your work will take on greater depth. All I'm doing is with the middle value now, blocking out the middle tones. If I have that done right, and what, and what am I looking at for? I am looking at the dark shapes. If I get those dark shapes correctly, like a jigsaw puzzle, together, it's gonna come out as the finish. That's all it is. Painting is nothing more than a series of little shapes, or big shapes if you work large, put together in such a way that when you finish, it all fits together and it looks right. Now, how do you get those little shapes done correctly? So what I'm doing now is I'm putting the brush down and I'm just flipping it up. And as I flip it, I erase it and I get those dry brush line effect. How do you get those little shapes correctly? Well, you start out with one, one shape that you no, you can do very nicely and very easily. It's like in drawing, you use a head as a measurement to get the rest of the proportions. In painting, you pick out one shape that you can do very nicely and accurately. And you draw that for, oh, shouldn't I say the word draw, paint. And then the next one you do, you compare it to that one. And if that works, then you do the next one. In other words, the first one is correct. And if you keep comparing to that, all the, all the other shapes, you'll be able to find that they all related, they're all in proportion to each other. It sounds easy what I'm saying, believe me, it's not. But that is the whole secret, if there is any secret. And there is no secrets in art, by the way. All there is is hard work. You don't learn to paint by reading about it. You learn to paint by painting. Brushes had a, I'm holding the brush at an angle this way, and I'm Painting this way, when the stroke is this way, I'm going that way, when the stroke is that way. And this is just all the darks, the meaning value, the darks, I'm gonna save the dark for the end. Okay. I also have next to me a piece of paper, the same paper that I paint on, and I test my brush and I test the color so that when I put it on here, I know what it looks like. In the old days, I, I know, for example, Velasquez, the great 
Spanish painter would always shape his brush before he made a stroke on the final. And how do we know that? Well, by x-rays, they've seen that his background has a whole bunch of random strokes, which indicated he was sh sh testing his color and brush on the canvas. Now with oils, you can cover it up, but in watercolor, unfortunately, you can't do that. Let's go on to here. Again, I like the square brushes. It, it's like a chisel for me. I'm carving out. It's like the old story that people say about Michelangelo. I don't know how true these things are. You know, you, these are all hand-me-downs or people make these things up. They ask them, you know, how does he do his sculptures? He said, it's easy. Just take away the things that don't belong there. Yeah, well, that's an easy answer. But how do you know what doesn't belong there? I have this one coming towards me. So I gotta be careful that I make the dark under it. See, things come forward to you because there's the shadow underneath it. See, like this, this, this part here. If you make the dark underneath, it's going to come forward. You can see that when you look at trees, especially. And that's, by the way, is one of the things that I do. I, I do outdoor plain air painting. And one of the things that students are totally surprised to find out that is that a tree has four sides. There's a front, a back, and two sides, left and right. And when you paint, you got to paint all four sides of that tree to make it look like a round tree. If you only paint the back and the two sides and never put anything in the front coming towards you, you've got a theater tree, a fake tree. You got to have something coming towards you because a tree is round. It's not flat. So that's one of the things that we do when we do plein air painting. In fact, I've got a workshop coming up in September, which is kind of fun. I'm going to go to Sicily and paint outdoors. I just finished one in Manhattan in September, four day painting around Manhattan, <laughs> which was a lot of fun. Thing about Manhattan people of interest, and they don't care what you do. You, we were in the middle of Fifth Avenue on Fort, uh, is it uh, 12th Street, painting away, and nobody stops. Now, there are two reasons why no one stopped. Either the paintings were in good, or the people, did, or they didn't care. The paintings were good. So it was a lot of, it, it, there is a kind of a fear about painting outside that self-conscious, but you know, people really admire you as an artist. You as an artist are a special breed. You're a magician. You make things happen. So art is a very special thing. And I, I think it's, it's magic. And you see how the trees beginning to develop? I'm going with the way it's moving. 
I change brushes naturally. Each has a, a little voice. But anyway, the workshop in Italy should be a lot of fun. See, I have the shape. I have the shape of this. And that's the, what I'm talking about when I said the shapes. Don't look at it the individual, don't look at the individual strands. That's not gonna give you the palm tree. What's gonna give you the palm tree is the shape of the leaf. So I paint <clears throat> this way, and then I will paint that way. You see the same brush give me different strokes by the way I manipulate it. That's what I mean about practicing with a brush so that when I pick up this brush, I know what it's gonna say, what it can do. It can't do what this one does because it's a different brush. Limit yourself at first to a few brushes to learn what they do. You don't really need a lot of brushes. I mean, I'm guilty of that, by the way. I love brushes. I'll use anywhere from 18 to 30 brushes on a painting because each one does a little something special. But at the beginning, I would say to learn your brushes, just pick out two or three and practice with them to learn. See, I can stop at this point and people will know what I'm painting. What I'm trying to say is that you, you'll know when you make the right marks on a painting, you'll know that the paint is coming out okay. I mean, and I can do maybe a masterpiece. Very few people do masterpieces all the time. I don't know of any artist who has done a painting and every painting is a masterpiece. I don't care who the artist is, Rembrandt or Rubens or Velasquez, they've done dog paintings, meaning they're terrible, just like the rest of us. They have they had good days and they had bad days. They're only human like you are. And you know that speaking of that, they had to st start sometime. They were students one time, just like we all are. So when students say, oh, I can never do that. Well, I don't know about that. They had to learn. Even Michelangelo had to go to school and learn. Oh, there you are. Don't sell yourself short. I'm splitting uh, what I'm doing, I should show you. I'm taking my brush, I'm pushing it down, I'm twisting it, I'm splitting the hairs. I don't know if you can see the hairs split. And that's gonna give me a mark that I want. These marks here. I don't paint, you know, dot for dot, line for line. I paint an impression. 
I paint a feeling. That's what I'm after. I'm after this tree and I'm, and I'm trying to feel the, what do I call the liveliness, the spontaneity of the tree. by making my quick strokes. I'm not a, a, a super realist type painter as you probably gathered. I'm more of a mood. I'm after mood. Because that's my personality. You know, then I have, and by the way, I also have Look at all these brushes. They're all the all square, but they all are, are a different size. And I try to select the right size for the right stroke. So here I want to get and twist the brush here and then quick the brush quick stroke and then here a, a sort of a transparent feeling of it at certain points i think you begin to see the feeling of the tree when I paint trees, by the way, I always start on top. I never start with the trunk. Because this is the tree. Every tree has a special shape. There are oval trees, squatty trees, triangular trees. They're all different types. You should learn the, the basic types of trees and you could identify an elm or maple or Cypress, whatever. They're very easy. Just go online, YouTube, and say tree identification shapes, and you look at them. This is about seven basic ones. So, I'm doing a, uh, I was telling yesterday that I'm doing a workshop on a Zoom workshop, which I've done before several times actually, for Cheap Joe in March. And it's three days. It's rather interesting, something that I've never tried before. And that is we're gonna do alternate three days. Like it's gonna be March 14th, 16th and 18th. In other words, Monday, Wednesday and Friday. The day in between, is when the people will work on their painting and then they can bring it in the next day and we can talk about it. Because when you have a workshop, like four, three days in a row, four days in a row, you never really get a chance to finish your painting and show it. So we thought maybe we'd try that, have a three day workshop, but alternate the days so that you get a, a break in between, first of all, and you get a chance to finish the painting. And, and show it the next day for a critique. See these the individuals, just little strokes that I know that this brush can do for me. <clears throat> this is all a middle value and I'm using hookers green and burnt umber sepia raw sienna Those are the colors I use to mix this. Let's 
Another thing is when I paint, I stand up. I, it's just a bad habit, but I have to because the work is so big. So big, I can't sit down and do a forty by thirty sitting down on in a, in a chair. I can't reach it. <laughs> so I have to stand up. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the heel of the brush, the back part. And I know when I do that, I get a certain mark that I like, that I think is needed here. You may or may not have ever heard of that expression, the, the voice of a brush, that each brush has a voice. They do. One of the things that people like to tell you is that art and music are related. Art, poetry are related. Yes, they are. But the, feel, the thing they fail to tell you is how. Or another thing, a very common thing that people say to you, well, you got to learn to simplify.
a little bit in the sky just for the tree, but I use a hairdryer to speed up the drying. Not sure how that's coming across, whether the the painting is clear or not. Mm -hmm. It's clear, it, Antonio, it's quite clear. Good. Okay, let me just get a little bit with the background so that I can finish the upper portion. <clears throat> right now, what I'm doing is cleaning my palette. Yeah, I, I clean my palette now for the other colors. You, you can't just leave the dirty, I shouldn't say dirty, you just can't leave the previous paint. It'll make the colors muddy. Where, Okay. Need a little bit of the blue for the sky behind the, the tree. So we, we can accent it where we need some darks, some lights. The background is pretty simple. You can just throw it in a wash almost. And just grade the wash from the cool on top to a little warmer as you get towards the earth. Come on, outside. Let's go out, everybody. Come on. Make the sides one a little bit darker than the other. Let's pick up a few. When it gets down to this light color, I paint right over the trunk of the tree. I don't try to paint around it. Because it's going to be covered up. It's such a light wash. Now the sky is light. I'm going to make the water darker. So there's a little contrast, but I have to be careful that the sky and the water don't run into each other because it is watercolor.
I need this background. So that I can get the right values. Now I'm making the brush a dry brush to give the sparkle of the water. Not all the way across, just somewhere in the deep portion. It's just a suggestion of the water. And I paint right over the tree and the leaves because this is light and the other one is dark. So I, I have a contrast and then just underneath this rock, which just juts out is a little darker because of the shadow. And just, you know, as the water gets nearer to us, it gets lighter. Some of it comes up on shore. And I'm using the brush at the side, and this is one of those calligraphy brushes. It's not a flat brush. The reason I'm using this brush is because it holds a lot of water and I can get more out of it here. By here, I mean in the ocean. Think a little bit darker on one side because I'm going to have to paint that rock and that rock is going to be darker. And just the horizon, it blends into the sky here. So I have just enough of the ocean that contrasts with the sky. And yet this now gives me a a background for the tree. I'm going to do the trunk next, and then I'm going to go in and finish the tree. In doing the tree trunk, it's relatively, uh, I shouldn't say easy, if you have a system. Well, by that I mean, I'm taking a brush that is big enough, the width of the trunk, okay? That's why I have different size brushes. Then I'm going to take paint and put it on only one portion of the brush. I'll show you what I mean. I'm going to wet it first. Then I'm going to take the paint and it's on one side of the brush only. I don't know if you can see this. Drag it on one side. And then I can get the volume, the dark side and the light side. Just a little way to it to get that. Have to I mean, get the color right. Well, when I say right, I, 
I really mean the value. I'm a value painter, I'm not a colorist. I look for the right value. You know, artists either fall into two categories. They're either uh, value painters or they're colorists. It depends how you, how you see things. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a, a clear wash, clear water wash. Sounds silly, clear wash of water. Then I'm going to pick up the paint, thick paint. I've determined that the sun is coming from this side, so I'm going to be darker on that side. That's determined already. Then I'm just going to look at it to see if it's wet enough. Yes. I'm just the edge of the brush. Pull it up. So it gives me the, and I'm gonna split the brush and dry brush it. Pull it across. This is what I was saying before about learning your brush. The, the, you know, the voice of your brush. Each, each brush could do something different for you. Go back and make this tree a little rounder. And it's darker up here because most of it is in shadow or the, the leaves cast the shadow down here. And when this dries, I can take same dry brush, dry it, and get these these lines that you find on these trees. It's all with just a few strokes, and each brush performing their own. <clears throat> special character or act in the in the play need some darks in the tree. Down here where the sun really doesn't catch too much. Back here. And possibly here. Yeah, they, they did it, right? 
Yeah. There we go. Yeah. That's why I needed the water back there so that I can, I know how dark to make these. I wasn't sure before, but now I do. One other thing that is good to do is to soften some edges. Because see right now, all the edges are the same. So I'm gonna soften it. I'm using this thing, it's called a fan brush. I'm sure you've seen them. Oil painters use them. just to soften the edge. What it does is, is it lightly, lightly, very lightly. So you can see this edge here now is softer than this edge. I wanna soften this one because that's further back. So you see, that's a softer than this. So by doing that, <clears throat> I'm creating volume, making treat some parts go back, some parts go, and underneath here, which usually cast in the kind of a shadow, you don't really see too much into it. You don't wanna overdo this, just, just a little bit, but you can see the sharpness and the softness, sharpness and the softness of edges. Oh, there's a whole story about edges. It's a fascinating story. We can spend what I'm doing right now is just putting some of those little bumps and lumps on the tree. Now I'll get to some of the rocks within the time we have left and show you a little bit of that. I'm sorry about the interruptions that we had before, but... I'm cleaning my palette <clears throat> because it's important that the paints, the colors that I use, and I don't use too many colors. It looks colorful, but I really don't use too many colors. Okay, now let's get to the rocks. Mm. Yeah, let's get to the rock. I was deciding whether to do the rocks or the sand first. Rocks are in very interesting also because we, we say here that in the Western world that rocks have planes, faces. There's a front, there's a side, there's a back. But in Asian art, <clears throat> which goes back 5,000 years compared to ours, it goes back maybe a couple of thousand years, they refer to rocks as having faces. There's a front face, a side face, and a back face. 
So rocks can have faces. Okay, let's start with down here. Now, this is dark here on this side. You see, this is the dark side of the tree. So I'm going to make a light side of the rock on that side. Then I'm going to make a dark side. on the light side of the tree. So that I'm giving the tree contrast. Just lightly indicating the rocks. I don't want to render the rocks because it's the tree that I want you to look at. If I put too much information here, it's gonna distract from that. This is my focal point. I will add things down here, but they're like a theater state setting. You have the lead actor and everyone else is a supporting actor. So this is my lead, and, these, and this is the cast of supporting actors and actresses. A suggestion of the rocks. Get them on the other side. I love the square brushes because it's so easy to carve out shapes like a sculptor with a chisel. I mean, put in the rocks here to balance that. If I didn't have that, it'd all be lopsided. So I'm putting that there, the rock. Couple of more little rocks here to give it some kind of a movement. See, I, I don't follow photographs. I follow what I think looks right or should be right for the painting. <clears throat> Because when people look at your or your work, all they're going to see is your painting. They're not going to see the reference, your photograph, or they're not going to be. Let's say if you did a plain air painting, you're not. They're not going to be with you. Couple of little. And I need something down here. You can see it. Need something down here.
which forms what I refer to as a triangular composition. Composition is something you can you spend your lifetime learning. You're going from here to there to here. It's a triangular composition. Let me just try this. Go back with another value. Now, when you're on the beach and you're doing shadows, the shadows are usually warm because there's a reflection from the sand. They're not really dark and cool. Uh, just a little bit more. Trying to find the right value. Trying to find the right value to balance the tree. Usually the darkest part is near the sand because the sun doesn't reach that low underneath the rock. Or if you can get the feeling of the, the sweep, I'm creating this sweep here, which my photograph doesn't have. And it gets just a little bit darker. It's just, let me just hit this a little bit. Oh, there, it's a little better. You weren't seeing the bottom. Let me just change this so you can see the bottom. Okay. Let me just fix that. Okay. See, you weren't seeing this part here. And because it's a sunny day, you can use a, a, some texture, a dry brush effect. trying to create this sweep. Am I gonna to be too concerned about this because this edge comes out nicely. So let leave that alone. Look at it as you work and you ask yourself, does it need anything? Putting things in doesn't necessarily always mean that it's better. Sometimes you put in too much and it's not. 
And I'm just going to put a, a little bit warmth on the rocks. Just a little bit of warmth. Then we're going to throw in some sand. Sand is warm. Should be on a beach. Sometimes it's too warm. I'm just practicing mixing the right value for the sand. I could, might as well just do it here. And in putting in the sand, I'm gonna use my side stroke. Because it gives the feeling if you see, of the ridges. And mixing it with the water a little bit. Getting into the rocks, up to the rocks. <clears throat> and if you can feel the sweep I'm trying to create. Let's get a little darker on this side. We'll get some yellow ochre in there. Just go back to the tree and do what I call accents. You don't mind if we run a few minutes over, do you? Do you uh, mind? Not at all, uh, not at all, oh. Antonio. Just, I'm, just I'm, I'm... more minutes up here. I really appreciate this, that you are continuing with all these horrible things happening. Thank you. No. Don't worry about it. Uh, those people, you know, have a very unhappy life. That's fair enough. You know, they're very unhappy life. If that's all, if that's what they consider fun in life, they really yep. don't know. They really don't know anything. <laughs> they're not. They're not constructive people. They're destructive. And totally, totally. I mean, we, if yeah. you were doing such a wonderful job, and yeah, they're negative. They're negative people. Ax there are two kinds of accents. There's a, a dark accent, and there's a light accent. Those are your lightest light and your darkest dark in your painting. This is right now is bad because it's like a hole in my painting. I've got to tone that down. This is when we get to the end and you start making little tweaks, which is natural. Some painters will do a painting and then put it away for several months and then go back to it because it, you just don't see some of these little things. Watch what, I, what I'm talking about. See, now it's not, it's not popping out like this, which this, this should because 
This is the nearest thing to us. This part is coming towards us, which is the way it should be. And underneath that, because that's the lightest, you've heard the expression, put the lightest and the darkest next to each other. Well, that's what I'm doing, which makes it, this pops out more. I'm saving my dark. Now the light accent, you can do it in several different ways. Now I'm looking for something. Where are you? There you are. Some people use white paint which is fine. I have nothing against white paint. I use white paint in my work all the time. And by that, I mean, I'll show you. I wanna get a, a just tight, a light accent here. Just, it's like a little highlight. little highlight. See how it pops out? That's one way to do it. But most watercolor artists will take a, a razor blade and scratch it out. And you see how this leaf now, because I'm accenting it, is not coming forward in comparison to the other one. Don't, you save those little accents for the end. Uh, not always, I mean, there are occasions when you put them in at the beginning, yes. But most of the time, like this accent, on the tree, the cat shadow. You save that. Uh, I could put, do just a tiny bit more here, texture around the bottom of the tree. I want the tree in the sand and growing out of the ground, not floating. And in, just to say a little bit about composition, what I've done is I've created for you a path to go into the picture. I've left this whole white area. So I'm pulling you into the picture in comparison to my reference, which doesn't do that. It blocks you. All those things in the front block you. Um, <clears throat> If we could, if you had any questions, I'd be more glad to answer them, but can we have any time for questions? Maybe a few, uh, just a few questions if anybody wants to ask anything. Please unmute yourself and... Anyone has a question? Have you ever uh, paint on um, watercolor on acrylic paint? I mean, uh, acrylic to canvas. On canvas? Well, they, yes. have, they have a watercolor canvas. Is that what you mean? Oh, I, I, yesterday I was looking at some website and they said that you can use some absorbent gesture on top of acrylic and yes. you can paint watercolor on it. Have you tried that? Well, I would I've used, it's called the gesso acrylic. Let me just put this down here. It's a gesso, which is used to prime canvases. And if it's the acrylic kind, it will absorb water. Because they have two kinds of gesso, oil of gesso and acrylic. Use the acrylic. I haven't put it on a canvas. I have put it on my watercolor paper and it works the same way. And you can do it on a canvas 
and prime it and then do watercolors on it. The only problem that I could foresee, it's not really a problem, is that the texture of the canvas will come through. And that texture will be consistent throughout your entire sheet of paper, or in this case, your canvas. But you can do it. Do you uh, wet the, uh, did you wet the sheet before you started, Andrew, uh, no. Antonio? No. No. I, okay. I didn't work, I, I didn't water, wet it. Mm. Okay. Oh, what size of it is, is it the 300 pounds or? This is 300 pounds, yes. And, and it's a full it, press or? This is a 300 pound rough. Rough. So you have okay. It is not uh what no the hot or the heated one, right? It's like a, it's cold first. This is arches. Yes. Three hundred pound rough. So I, with the three hundred pounds, you don't need to stretch it. That correct? No, you don't. But I do use a hundred and forty pound watercolor paper. And I stretch it on a canvas stretcher. And if you want to put the gesture, the water, uh, the acrylic one on top, mm -hmm. um, what kind of paper underneath you think you can use? And uh, is the, the painting on top of the gesture, is it different from just painting on the paper itself? Yes, because you will find if you paint on the gesso, the acrylic gesso, that's what we're discussing, it would, parts of areas would be water repellent. You cannot get a smooth wash. You get a rough surface. The paint will be a rough looking texture, you can't get a smooth wash on the acrylic. If you want it to look like an impressionist painting where you it's a, a lot of texture, you gesso it. I've done several of those. We went into my, my book called New York's Golden Age of Bridges. I have some paintings in there that were done on gesso paper. And they look like, or even go on my website, antoniomasi.com, and you'll see some paintings that look like they're sparkling because they were done on gesso. Antonio, just a one quick question. How, you, you worked, how did you make the green? You said you put so I, many colors. Green, I used hookers green. Hookers. Hookers. Okay. Green. Uh, okay. Uh. Burnt umber. Okay. Uh, sienna. Burnt sienna. Uh. And raw sienna. I okay. always mix my colors. I never use them the way they come out of the tube. If I'm using blue, I would mm. take at least two blues and put them together so that it doesn't look like it came out of a tube. Okay, thank you, yes. If I take this, watch what happens when I take the tape off, how the painting will have a different life. Mm. Oh, it's very beautiful. By the way, the demo is for sale. If anybody wants to buy it, it's $325, $325. My gallery sells them for $950. But anyway, that's a different story. So if, you, mm -hmm. if you're interested, just contact me. Uh, and the other thing I could remind you, if you're interested in learning more about brushes and paper and how to paint things and about art. Uh, join me with Chief Joe's workshop in March, three days, 
alternate days and then we'll be able to have more time. It'll be a six hours each day with a lunch in between and we can really get a lot more done. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Antonio. Thank this you was all. wonderful. I'm sorry about yeah. the craziness of it today. Oh yes, we we are sorry too. We are very sorry, but it, but still admire you for going through with it without blinking. You know, I'm so impressed. We you are know, so impressed. Like I, you know, we started the conversation about painting outdoors in New York City. Uh huh. You can get. You cannot be. What's the word? Uh, you can't get more toughened than when you paint out Manhattan on Fifth Avenue and 12th Street and thousands of people walking by and to have some of these people that unfortunately they have a sad life don't have anything better to do. So that, that's, Thank you. Just, that's just nothing. It's a Thank lesson you, for all of us. Thank, Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Okay, you too. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you all for coming back. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Yeah, people, uh, Andrew says amazing. Thank you. Perfect warm thoughts for a chilly day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I thought. Eight degrees up here. Man, what's cold? <laughs> <laughs> All and, right. Uh, another care, another person want. says, okay, thank you. Another person right. says, thank you, Antonio. It was a very informative and inspiring presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.